So as you know, um, there's been a growing debate about the interpretation of this fact, which is the growing concentration uh, across many industries within the, the US. So here I'm plotting the change over time of CR8, which is, so eight means eight firms. So CR8 is the cumulative market share of the top eight firms in a given industry. So you can do it for each industry, and then you take the average of that measure across industries, and then we plot two groups here, one series for manufacturing, the other series for non-manufacturing. The dotted line in the middle is because there's a change of SIC to NIX uh, code, so it's not exactly comparable. So as you can see, uh, CR8 went up by about eight points uh, in the US from a baseline of about 0 0.3. So think of it as we went from 0 0.3 to 0 0.38 on average. And um, so that's the fact, but there's much disagreement about what this fact means. So we're gonna try to make sense of it. And of course, in the context of uh, other stylized facts, the first one is at the same period as you see the increase in concentration, you see a sharp increase in profits. So this is the after tax net profit margin, which went from about 7% to about 10% over the same period of time. And of course, exactly at the same time, you see a drop in the labor share by about five points, from about 0.64 to about 0.59. So these are well-known facts. The first thing we want to emphasize is these are US facts. That may be a bit more controversial actually, but uh, this is not happening in other countries. Okay, so this is concentration for comparable measure to the extent possible. Also, this is the OECD measure uh, of concentration that they gently uh, agree to share with us. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in the background of these figures. Um, so you see concentration in the US versus Europe. So there is a little bit of an increase in Europe as well, but I don't think that that's a striking fact in that figure. Um, profits, same story. The only place where profits are really increasing quickly is the US. You don't see that in Europe, neither in the Eurozone, nor in the EU28, uh, but you don't see that in Japan and Korea either. And finally, the drop in the labor share since 2000 is also a US-specific phenomenon. This is the labor share in Europe as a comparison. It's completely flat. Okay, so the key message of the paper is, of course, that concentration in and of itself doesn't tell you much directly because concentration is an endogenous object and it could be associated to good changes or bad changes. So here's a simple model to think about all of that. At the end of the day, there is only one equation that matters. That's the free entry condition. Everything else is a bit uh, uh, less important, but free entry is the key. So start backward, these are the profits you make exposed. Okay, so imagine uh, an industry where the average markup is mu, and I'm looking at the profit of a particular firm with a productivity little a, when the productivity of the industry is big A, and the elasticity of demand is sigma. And uh, PY is uh, revenues for the industry, N is the number of firms, and phi is the fixed operating cost. All right, so this will be the profit that the firm is going to make every period. Now, free entry says that the capitalized value of the profit, so here I'm assuming some discount factor R and some exogenous destruction rate delta, so the capitalized value of the profit has to be less than the entry cost kappa. So from now on, kappa is going to be my entry cost. Okay, so when I think about shocks to free entry, I think of shocks to kappa. <coughs> Now, if you look at a symmetric equilibrium for one second, so imagine all the little a's are equal to the big A, then of course things drop out and every firm is gonna produce the same amount. And then the free entry condition directly depends on how many firms are gonna be uh, active. And the number of firms is gonna be given by that formula, which is just making the free entry equal. Now, this formula tells you pretty much all you want to know. That shows why concentration in and of itself is not uh, informative. Because you could have bad concentration, so if kappa goes up, then the number of firms is going to drop, the market is going to be less competitive, and you're going to have uh, you know, more concentration of the bad type. That could be driven by bear by entry, which themselves could be driven by regulations, captures of regulators, all kinds of stuff. Um, or you could have the good concentration, which is driven, for instance, uh, by higher competition exposed. So if your exposed profit margin mu is smaller, then you need to be larger to recoup the entry cost, in which case a more competitive market will lead to concentration. And there's plenty of evidence of that going on uh, in, in the US and other countries. 
It could also be an efficient response to a change in the distribution of underlying productivity. Okay? If the distribution of the little a has a power law and you fatten the tail, then you're going to get more concentration too. And it might very well be very efficient. Um, so final point that's very important from this is that if you bring back heterogeneity, then a, a key insight in the literature is the selection effect, okay? which is if there is heterogeneity in little a, then what happens is some firms are going to try to enter, but they're going to drop out because they are not productive enough. So in that case, the free entry condition says that the flow value of the fixed cost, R plus delta K, must be equal to the expected profit conditional on survival. And this A star is the cutoff. And it's easy to see here that if sigma goes up, A star goes up. In a more competitive market, you have more selection effect. Therefore, you have a higher chance of not being able to produce. But then the flip side, of course, is that conditional on producing, so for the firms you actually observe in the data, they're going to make higher profits. Okay? Therefore, higher realized profit could also be a sign of higher competition. Okay? So that's the challenge we want to tackle in this, in this paper. We want to say, okay, now I'm going to try to find indices, covariances, cross-equation restrictions that are going to separate the two ideas of good and bad concentration. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at one case where we know exactly what happened, which is Chinese entry, uh, the entry of China in the WTO. So we know that's a massive competition shock for U.S. producers. And we're going to see what happens. Okay. Well, what happens is exactly along the lines of the selection effect you would expect. So on the left, you have the number of firms normalized to 1 in 1991. Okay, so, and that's the ratio. So if this thing is 1.2, that means the number of firms went up by 20%. And uh, there are two lines because uh, we draw the line for industries. This is the number of firms in industries that have a low exposure to China in green. And in red is number of firms in industries that have a high exposure to China. As you can see, they, they share the pre-trend very well. So until 2000, they all look very similar. And since 2000, of course, a massive change. And today, the number of firms is about 60% different. Okay, so it's a massive selection effect. Um, so that's the first thing. And then, obviously, that means that now, if you look at manufacturing and you ask yourself, why is concentration increasing in manufacturing? Well, a lot of it is import competition. But of course, that's the good type of, comp of concentration. Okay? And one way to see how big that is, is on the right, you have manufacturing industries that are in the top half of their openness to trade. Okay? So in the naive measure of competition, of concentration, the green line would show that domestic concentration is rising here. But if you bring back imports and you do an import adjusted measure of concentration, it's still going up a little bit, but it's mostly flat. Okay? So the bottom line here is that quantitatively, if you look at the part of manufacturing which trades heavily, heavily then we think that essentially all that's happening is driven by foreign competition. There's not much else in terms of concentration. Um, but the China shock also allows us to do something else, which we didn't quite expect, but turned out to be very interesting, which is how do the survivor respond to a China shock? Well, they respond by investing more, and by investing more specifically in intangible assets. They produce a, a wider variety of goods, and they try to innovate to grow. That makes sense. They know they can't compete in price with China, so they will compete in other dimensions. But now think about what that does. They are Capital and cost structure is going to shift more and more toward intangible assets and intangible expenses. Okay? So although on the left, you can see their profits going down. This is just log of their profits over time. So China, this is the coefficient on the regression where you put uh, the uh, in NTR gap as an instrument. Um, so you can see their profits get hit, of course, when China enters. But they shift their expenditures towards, non, uh, towards intangible expenditures. Which means that, and they do it to such an extent that the ratio of sales to the cost of goods sold actually goes up. Now, the, lit the literature that have you seen recently that measures markups in countries and over time tend to use that as the measure of markup. Okay, essentially, their measure is sales over COGS times some elasticity, which is essentially not time varying. Therefore, at the end of the day, these, these measures tend to um, attribute any increase in sales over COX to an increase in market. So if you use that as a measure, then I would tell you after China, we see more markup, less competition. Okay? So we don't think that works very well. Therefore, we're not going to use it uh, in the rest of the paper. 
And this is not just for, this was like a case study of about five or 10% of the US economy, which is the one that's heavily open to China, but it's true globally. So this is sales over COGS in green for all the big countries versus profits. The, the, the trend increase in sales over COGS is all over the place. It's actually almost exactly the same, num even numerically, quantitatively in every region, okay? So that's not, so that when people say markups have been going everywhere, that's because they are throwing the green line. But I don't think that measures competition. See uh, the China shock. Instead, the green, uh, the red, sorry, these are profits, and there you can see that there is something specific in the U.S. relative to the other regions. Okay, so now what we want to do is find predictions that are different, okay, where we can tell apart quote-unquote good concentration from quote-unquote bad concentration. Okay, so here's one example. Suppose you write a standard model and you add uh, productivity shocks and uh, demand shocks. Then the market share of firm I in industry J at time T is going to be given by this simple formula. H is the demand shock, that's the demand shifter to your, in, to your demand curve. N is the number of firms. And then, you, of course, you have the ratios of productivities, U relative to your industry, to the power sigma. Okay, now in this model, take the log of that, compute the variance over time, the variance of log market share is going to be the variance of the log demand shocks plus sigma minus one squared times the variance of the productivity shock. So if you hold constant the fundamental shocks to either tastes of people and productivity of firms, an increase in sigma would predict higher turnover of market shares. Okay? And that's very different from the prediction of the model based on restriction to entry, which predicts less exit, less entry, and less turnover. So now I'm going to highlight four dimensions in which quote-unquote the good story versus the bad story make the opposite predictions and I'm going to show you, you know, which one fits the, fits the data. And the punchline is going to be that early on, we th the signs suggest we had a lot of good concentration. Since 2000, this, what we find is mostly consistent with the bad concentration. So point number one, turnover, that's easy. So this is, um, this is, that's a really easy one. You just take all the firms by industry, you rank them from the first one to the last one in the industry, you do it over five years windows, and you compute the correlation of the ranking. Right? So suppose that there is absolutely no change, no turnover whatsoever, then the ranking would be the same in the T and T plus 5. Therefore, the correlation of the ranking would be 1. This is 1 minus the correlation of the ranking. Okay? So that's a measure of churning or reshuffling. So roughly speaking, the turnover went from about 12% to about 6%, or maybe 7%, sorry. Okay? So there is much less reshuffling of market shares of who is the leader and who is the follower within each industry in the U.S. today than there was 20 years ago. Test number two, um, investment. So if you increase sigma, you make the market more competitive exposed, firms are going to grow larger. In fact, they're going to be closer to the perfect competition benchmark. Okay? Then Q theory is going to work even better. Okay? Or the flip side, if you want, uh, is that if you estimate the Q theory equation, then the residual new Q equation uh, could be a measure of the um, competitive uh, or lack of competition. So here's what we do. We just run a Q equation for uh, the growth rate of the capital stock for all capital, equipment, structure, and IP. Okay, this is just from the BA data. And what you can see is that in all dimension, you see a, an increasing gap between what you would predict firms should do given Tobin's Q and what they actually do in terms of their investment. Of course, so equipment and structure, that may not be surprising, but what's interesting is this is true even if you look at IP. Okay. In other words, the 1990s, according to the BEA, I'm sure we can discuss uh, you know, measurement, but according to the BEA, the 1990s was a period of very fast growth in intangible assets, but that is not true today with the same measure. Final test, the correlation between concentration, or the covariance, I should say, between concentration and um, either TFP growth or prices or markups. Okay, so imagine you write a simple structural model and you, you, you shock the model by shock to sigma. Okay, what kind of cross equation covariance are you gonna generate in that model? Well, you're gonna generate positive covariance between productivity and concentration. You're gonna create negative covariance between prices and concentration. And you're gonna create a negative covariance between concentration and markups. And as you can see, this is exactly what we see on average pre-2000. Pre-2000, 
you could say that if you pick at random an industry and you see that that industry is getting more concentrated more quickly than some other industry, you could guess that it was an industry that also had higher TFP growth, lower uh, price inflation, and lower market growth. If you do it since 2000, it's exactly the opposite. So to conclude, um, we try to um, give you a way, perhaps, hopefully, a way of thinking about all of these facts at the same time. Okay? And that's the challenge, that was the challenge in writing the paper. So we come up with this idea. So since we are trying to tell a binary story, good versus bad, is it true that in the data you could come up with something like that? So we just run a uh, principal component on all the variables of interest. And it turns out that the first two principal components actually capture a lot of the variance indeed. Okay? And it also turns out that their loading are consistent with the story that we are telling. So here you have a lot of data. So on the left, you have measures of concentration. Here you have all the stuff with, with uh, intangible investment. Here you have import competition. Here you have profit. Here you have the labor share, productivity growth. Here you have inflation. And here you have the turnover measure. And then the investment gap. Okay. Now, if you look at it, PC1 looks very much what, like what you would get in a world which is driven by shocks to intangible investment opportunities or uh, and perhaps driven by a higher competition in the market or for the market. Because that's a principal component that predicts more, in, that actually doesn't lead to a lot more concentration, but somewhat more concentration. It does give a little bit more markup, not huge, but some more markup, as we predict. But it comes with high investment in intangible and, um, you know, low price inflation, or even negative, or less than the average. That looks like the good stuff. The red one has exactly the opposite. It predicts a massive drop in the labor share. Uh, it is has a negative loading on, on price competition, as you would expect. Uh, and it creates a lot of concentration. But at the same time, it creates high markup, but the markup comes from higher prices, unlike, unlike the other one. So look, that looks more at like the bad concentration part. And so it turns out that first, as a description of the world, it's not too bad in the sense that it does capture quite a bit of the variance. So using that, you can start to tell a systematic story that um, is sector specific, point number one. And point number two, these are the scores on these two factors. So that's sort of the story we want to tell, which is pre-2000, so unfortunately the data in the, the further back you go, the data becomes less available, so we cannot do like a very long time search. But is it suggestive that since 2000, the relative importance of the PC2 has increased relative to the relative importance of PC1. So we are not saying that there are no industries out there that are driven by fast intangible investment and competitive market. We're not saying that. We're saying that there are fewer than before and many more that are driven by something that looks like rising balance rate. Now, why would that be? So the first thing you could imagine, which we test and find support for in the data, is that um, you know, if concentration goes up, the marginal negative impact of concentration could increase the level of concentration. In other words, if you go from like 0.1 to 0.12, maybe that's no big deal. But if you go from 0.4 to 0.42, maybe that's a big deal. And we do find evidence for that. So like the, the marginal increase in the markup is higher when you start from already concentrated industry. So that explains some of it. The other thing we find um, is that actually the nature of the concentration shock has changed. And there the prime uh, suspect here is definitely uh, lobbying, which is um, the one thing that has changed in 2000 massively, and in the US specifically, is corporate lobbying um, by, by like several orders of magnitude. And, um, and in the research I'm doing with uh, Herman, uh, we find that the kind of regulation or the kind of barriers to entry or the kind of concentration you find after a big increase in lobbying is quite different from the kind of regulation you find not preceded by an increase in lobbying. And so that pr lobbying predicts the bad type of concentration, okay, the one where you see higher prices and higher profits of incumbents and lower growth rates for the small firms. 